You boys be quiet down there! The early 90s was an amazing time for the Castlevania series. Konami allowed several teams to see what they could create for various platforms. Beyond the amazing Super Castlevania 4 for SNES, we also got Castlevania Bloodlines on Sega Genesis and Dracula X Rondo of Blood for the PC Engine. But today we're going to talk about that other game, Akuma Joe Dracula, Castlevania for the Sharp X68000 computer. Does it hold up against the other games? We're also going to geek out to some Castlevania music along the way and take a close look at the game's soundtrack. Akuma Joe Dracula was released for the Sharp X68000 computer in July of 1993. Of course it was never released in English in its original format on the X68000, but a re-release and remaster was later made for the PlayStation 1, titled Castlevania Chronicles, which was released internationally. The game was developed with what would have been a typical sized team and budget at Konami for a console game. Konami had already released a number of games for the X68000 prior, consisting primarily of ports of their arcade titles. The X68000 doesn't usually get a dedicated entry into a well-known series, so in some ways it's a miracle that this game was ever made. In a 1993 interview, director and programmer Hideo Axelay Ueda stated, Among X68000 users, there's been a lot of clamor for arcade conversions. I won't buy anything else is the kind of image we had, but instead of simply porting another Castlevania game, we decided to create a new, highly original Castlevania, and seeing it so well received by the players made me proud of that decision. X68000 Konami games from around this time came in sort of an unusual package, consisting of a cardboard sleeve covering a plastic case. The plastic case has a transparent door that can be lifted up to access the contents. The manual is black and white, and consists mostly of information on how to start and play the game. The game comes on two 5-inch floppy disks. You can see that ours is unfortunately missing the sleeve for one of the disks. Also missing is a user disk label, registration card, and some advertisement flyers that originally came with the game. The game can be played either directly from the floppy disks or installed on the hard drive if your X68000 has one. Before playing from the floppy disks, you'll need to create a user disk by booting with disk B in drive 0. You'll be prompted to put a blank disk in drive 1. Now that I have my user disk, I can put the X68000 keyboard away since the game itself doesn't use the keyboard at all. I can also put away disk B because all the game data needed from disk B has been copied onto my user disk. I can now boot the game by inserting disk A in drive 0 and my user disk in drive 1. When you load up Akuma Joe Dracula, you'll first be greeted with this screen, where you can select which sound technology to use for the game's soundtrack. The first option is the X68000's default audio, which consists of FM sound, provided by the built-in YM2151 synthesizer. The other two far less frequently used options both require an external MIDI device connected to your X68000. Curiously, the screen defaults to the bottom MIDI option rather than the much more commonly used built-in FM option at the top. We will revisit and demo the other two MIDI options later in this video, since I've tracked down MIDI modules compatible with each of these technologies. But for now, let's just stick with the default FM sound. After making your sound selection, you'll get music in a black screen. You may have to wait about a minute and 20 seconds here, enjoying the music with nothing on screen. The system is actually loading the entire game into memory from the discs here. Quoting Axel Ueda, Don't be afraid to credit feed. We knew people would, so we worked hard to make sure you could continue without any disc loading time. So this initial load of the entire game is called On Memory Mode, and eliminates any in-game disc access. You need an X68000 with at least 2 megabytes of RAM in order to take advantage of this though. Earlier models, like our Ace here, will load between each level instead, unless they've had their RAM expanded like this one has. The amount of memory available here is really ridiculous compared to consoles of the time. Not only does the game show off the rich graphics afforded by the X68000, but the fact that it can absurdly load the entire game into memory all at once is the cherry on top. The only drawback is how much time you have to wait every time you turn on the game. At least they had the foresight to put some excellent music here to entertain you during the wait. Some of my first exposure to this game actually came from the Akuma Joe Dracula X 2 disc soundtrack CD released the same year as the game. 
Though this is mostly a soundtrack for Rondo of Blood and Bloodlines, the last section of Disc 2 has four tracks from the X68000 game. At the time, I knew nothing about the X68000 game and had no idea that this particular track was only used for a blank loading screen. It felt more than good enough to be used as one of the main stage BGMs. After all that loading time is done, there's a rather gory opening scene where a satanic priest revives Dracula while crushing a beating human heart. Here's an example of a graphic feature afforded by the X68000 hardware, this crossfade transition during the opening sequence. There is a point where you're able to see both the previous scene and the next scene at the same time, owing to the X68000's ability to handle several layers at once. On most consoles at the time you would normally get a hard cut between one scene to the next, but the X68000 enables this subtle effect, adding to the high quality feel of the game. This save and load screen is quite similar to the Japanese version of the original Castlevania game, Akuma Joe Dracula for the Famicom Disk System. Since the original Castlevania was a cartridge game outside of Japan, the save feature was removed from the international versions. The saves here are of course saved to your user disk or hard drive. There are also a couple of cool options at the bottom of the screen. You can flip the trigger buttons to make sure that no matter what controller you're using, you can put the jump button on the right. Which is the only way it should ever be. Even cooler is the final option. If you're using an FM Towns controller, enabling this will allow you to use the start and select buttons to make selections and pause the game. And after the obligatory shot of Simon in front of the castle, the game begins. Players will quickly notice here that this all resembles stage one of the first Castlevania game, with even an arrangement of the same tune, Vampire Killer. Because, spoiler alert, Akumajo Dracula X68000 is a remake of the original NES game, which was also called Akumajo Dracula in Japan. This separates the X68000 game from Rondo of Blood and Bloodlines, because those are completely original new games. As a consequence, the X68000 game doesn't really have its own sort of main theme music like the other games have. Usually this would be the Stage 1 BGM. Super Castlevania 4 had Theme of Simon Belmont. Dracula X Rondo of Blood had Opposing Bloodlines. And Castlevania Bloodlines had Reincarnated Soul. For the most part, this is a by-the-numbers remake of the first stage from the original game, with some very nice graphical upgrades. You get some foreshadowing outside the window, of an enemy which will appear later. And you may notice that this game is already a bit tougher than the original, with bats that entered the scene flying in from open windows in the background. There are also some unexpected surprises that might catch you off guard if you're expecting this to be exactly like the first game. Besides the normal whip directions, you can whip downward and diagonally downward while jumping. You can also turn around mid-jump, so you aren't committed to your jumps like in many of the other games. There's a glitch in this game where sometimes the items land partway inside of platforms. To collect these, you have to actually duck rather than just walking over them. Slightly annoying, but manageable. The stage closes with a similar vampire bat boss as in the first game. Stage 2 sends the message from the outset that this will not be a one-for-one -one remake of the original. You wouldn't expect to be suddenly in a cave after entering the castle through the main entrance in Stage 1, but the map screen shows Simon taking a detour underground here for some reason. Look at all the background parallax layers here. It even shows some of the coming enemies approaching in the background. Here, instead of a remix of an old tune, we get a rocking original song made for this game, titled Thrashered in the Cave. This track was the one song wisely chosen to represent this game in the Dracula Battle series of soundtrack CDs. The Basement Brothers used to listen to those CDs on repeat in the car back in the day. If the second stage is a remake from the original Castlevania, it would have to be stage 4 since it's underground and has this part where you have to kneel on a moving platform. But this stage also reminds me a lot of stage 3 from Super Castlevania 4. Just like in that cave stage, we get falling stalactites from the ceiling, except this time they are used as platforms to cross. Later on in the stage we can open this hidden passage, again similar to in Castlevania 4, where we get a very strange one-off encounter with this hooded character. The character feels like a bit of a callback to these merchants in the MSX game, as well as these in Castlevania 2, except this one is playing a flute and has some items to choose from. 
You can choose to attack this figure, causing them to offer a different selection of items. You have to whip the item you want from the wheel, and the timing is easier said than done. The stage concludes with a vertical auto-scrolling section where a part of the cavern floods, restricting you to this increasingly narrow platform. This section feels kind of similar to stage 2 in Bloodlines, where you are instead descending as the water drains. Unlike the Mega Drive, the X68000 doesn't need to rely on the mid-scan palette swap trick that was used to create the below water effect in Bloodlines and other Mega Drive games like Sonic. The X68000 makes the effect look easy, but according to Axelay Ueda in the original developer notes included on the game's floppy disk, using semi-transparency is difficult. The X68000 can't do addition or subtraction like the SNES, although it'd be easy if you could flip the palette's lowest order bit. So in order to make the most of the original X68000's resources, I tried to put in all sorts of dubious functions. I like Ueda's use of the term dubious functions here. It makes it sound like the team really rose to the challenge of working within the limitations of the hardware in unconventional ways, without giving away their secrets. Despite skipping over Stage 2 from the original game, Stage 3 in the X68000 game seems to be a garden-themed stage, acting as a stand-in for the original hanging sculpture garden which is also Stage 3 of the original, as indicated by the reused music here. Except here we get attacked by phantom trees, enchanted water from a fountain, and archer statues. This area where the birds drop hunchbacks is a remake of this area from stage 4 of the original Castlevania, which makes sense to be here in this spot of the castle if you assume the cave in the previous stage was stage 4 from the original. This is also where the game has a sudden jump in difficulty for some reason. I guess they wanted to give players a couple of introductory stages before fully dialing up the difficulty. From here on out, all hits in this game take away a quarter of Simon's life gauge, effectively killing you after you take only four hits. In the same interview referenced earlier, Axelay Ueda said, in reference to the mail-in comment cards packaged with the game, when we made Akumajo Dracula X68000, our idea of the average X68000 user was a hardcore game player, someone who's really good at games. So there have been some complaints from users who have found it too hard and can't get past the second stage, but the majority of the responses have said that they were able to clear the game after so many hours of practice, and had a lot of fun. So yes, it isn't my imagination. This game was deliberately made more difficult than the other Castlevanias. By the way, if you're looking for an easier version of the game, the Arrange mode in Castlevania Chronicles for the PS1 has the difficulty dialed down quite a bit. Stage 3 is like three stages in one. The second section is a swamp area, much like the swamp stage found in Castlevania 3, with frog enemies. The final section is an ice area, complete with slippery floor. I think the boss of this stage is supposed to be the priest who revived Dracula in the opening. Stage 4 is a remake of Stage 2 from the original. You stupid bone dragon! Stop that! Cooperate! What can you do stuck to a wall? They've wisely gone with bloody tears from Castlevania 2 here, rather than the Stage 2 music from Castlevania 1. The stage is a pretty big step up in difficulty from the original, especially in the final section where you're attacked by a stained glass monster. The stage even has Medusa as the boss. Excuse me! Hello there. Handsome. You can try using holy water to freeze her like in the original, but she'll jump and lunge at you while whipping her tail and throwing snakes, making this boss sort of a crapshoot. At least she has a tell. Her tail turns purple just before she whips it at you. It's actually a lot easier if you can manage to hold onto the boomerang from the previous stage and use that instead of holy water. Ooh. Well, I must be out of shape. I feel kind of stiff. Stage 5 is the obligatory clock tower stage. Although the final stage in the original Castlevania was also clock tower themed, there was no exact equivalent of this stage, so we finally get some more original music here that isn't from a previous game. The first new song since stage 2. This stage and the next one are actually based on stages from the Dracula's Castle section of Super Castlevania 4. Learning to navigate these gears and moving platforms can be tedious, and can lead to falls that set you back. These seesaw platforms need to be lined up just right before you can jump to the next platform. Now jump on it, Peter Tarr! You gotta be kidding! You wanna save Christmas or not? But after practicing this stage a few times, it becomes pretty manageable. The detail of blood and entrails left on this gear is a nice gory touch. Someone didn't make it through here. 
The werewolf boss reminds me of the werewolf from Rondo of Blood, but this encounter is a bit different. It's also cool that the clock in the background displays the actual time set on the X68000's internal clock. There's also another area where the background colors change depending on the season. Excellent Ueda If you come back to the game after several months and clear the first loop again, you might discover something interesting. Stage 6 is broken into two sections. The first has an original song made for this game called Moon Fight. I would argue that this is the true main theme song of this game, even though it isn't on the first stage. Case in point, Konami seems to have selected this as the track to represent this game on that Akumajo Dracula X 2 disc soundtrack that I mentioned earlier, opening the X68000 section of that CD. Also, in many Castlevania games, the stage clear jingle is based on the main theme of the game. And in this one, it seems to be based on Moonfight. It's similar to the final phrase of the song. This first area of the stage is short. You have to keep moving on this crumbling bridge. This area is based on this part from Castlevania 4 with a falling bridge. This one is especially tricky. Try timing your jumps over the Medusa heads so you don't have to stop and kill them. The next section of stage 6 has another completely new song. So not only does the game not open with Moonfight, it's also underutilized. This part is deceptively tricky, since these enchanted dolls will dodge your attacks unless you time them perfectly. They have voices that say, and the four hit deaths make the trek upward in this section a bit of an ordeal. Before the boss, the stage is capped off with a hall of mirrors, which is a nice chance to show off some more X68000 graphic effects. Watch out for falling mirrors. Bob, leave it to Simon to find a mirror. It's a great reflection on me, don't you think? We did it! We're free of the mirror world! The boss is a reflection of Simon, who is able to use your sub-weapon and heart energy, so it'll be a lot easier if you can manage to get here with either no hearts or no sub-weapon. Stage 7 is a remake of Stage 5 from the original, complete with the Grim Reaper as the boss. Just as in the original, you're going to want to use the boomerang on him. He's actually a pushover compared to the original. The stage dispenses with the original BGM and instead goes with another original tune. Frankenstein's monster also makes an appearance partway through the stage, rather than appearing as a boss in this game. Stage 8 is a mostly new stage, consisting of these new crossbow enemies. There's just one part similar to the final stage of the original game, where the stage 1 boss returns as a regular enemy. Again, we get some cool graphic effects here when one of the chandeliers falls and starts the room ablaze. Rather than the music from the original game, they've gone with a new arrangement of Theme of Simon Belmont, which you'll recognize as that Castlevania 4 song. The end boss of this game really yields no surprises. It's a straight remake of the original end boss. And like in the original, you can continue as much as you want right from the boss without repeating the rest of the stage. The end credits are similar to the original game, but there is a new ending theme music. This is a great piece that was featured on that two disc Dracula X soundtrack I keep mentioning. I like the way the song ends with the carefree guitar section in the CD version. It's a rare, hopeful, uplifting moment for a Castlevania soundtrack, capping off this game. Then the game starts over at stage 1, but don't turn off your X68000 just yet. The game actually has six distinct loops. In the developer notes, graphic designer Hiroyuki Ito mentions, If you can, don't just stop at the first loop. Some interesting things may await you if you can make it to all six. <laughs> the most disappointing thing about the X68000 game is that rather than being a completely original Castlevania outing, it's a pretty straight remake of the original Castlevania. And why bother with that? Super Castlevania 4 is already a masterclass in how to remake the original game. Perhaps the distinction between the two is that the X68000 game is a remake of the original, whereas Super Castlevania 4 is a retelling. 
I know I'm splitting hairs here, but there is an important difference. Castlevania IV takes plenty of liberties and is clearly its own distinct game, whereas this game seems to more directly fill the need to revisit the original. Per Axel Ueda, we all thought that the original Castlevania for the Famicom was the best one. So while we were aware that this would, in terms of its system, be a rather old-fashioned game, throughout the development we kept in sight the goal of taking the best elements of the Famicom Castlevania. This is also evidenced in the game's soundtrack. Though the game consists of 8 stages, only half of those have new BGM. At least all menu, boss, and ending themes are new. But take Castlevania Bloodlines on the Mega Drive, for example. That's a completely original game with an almost entirely new soundtrack. When that game was released, we were all curious to hear Genesis renditions of the classic Castlevania tunes. But that game at least showed the restraint to confine most of the reused music to the game's sound test as bonuses, leaving the game's six stages for Michiru Yamane's excellent original soundtrack. Now let's go back and take a look at those two MIDI sound options as promised. This first option uses a technology called Roland LA. I was able to acquire a Roland CM64 sound module which supports this. Let's take it out of the box and get it hooked up. It requires a standard MIDI cable for the connection, along with an adapter to convert the larger MIDI DIN plug to the smaller one on my MIDI card slotted into the back of the X68000. It may be surprising that there is no simple built-in way to mix the sound effects from the X68000 with the music from the MIDI module. You can't just route the MIDI music back into the X68000. Instead, users usually resort to external audio mixers. In my case, I'm just using this passive audio mixer I grabbed on an online auction, which seems to work fine without adulterating the sound quality, although the output is a bit on the quiet side. I love the theremin sound used in the loading music in the LA MIDI version. Perhaps this is an example of the artist's true intention coming out through the use of better technology, and it was just harder to tell the sound they were trying to get at in the FM version. The final music option is Roland GS. I have a Roland CM300, which is able to take advantage of this MIDI standard. The GS standard is decidedly better than LA, though not by a huge margin which is perhaps why the GS is the last on the list, with the pitch of the selection sound getting progressively higher for each selection, indicating an upgrade in sound quality the further you go down the list. The type of instruments used can be surprisingly different between the LA and GS versions at some points, so it's apparent that they really gave attention to each version of the soundtrack. In general, the GS renditions are superior to the LA ones, but there are a few songs where I slightly prefer the LA version, so although GS is the clear winner, it's not a total blowout. Perhaps this era of MIDI can sometimes sound like SNES music, if SNES had a lot more memory. But that isn't really a good comparison. The SNES plays back recorded custom samples stored in a very small amount of memory. These MIDI modules, on the other hand, have built-in preset high-quality instruments for the sound designers to choose from. This type of external MIDI capability was of course limited to the PC gaming space in both Japan and the West, so it's a very unique approach for a mostly arcade and console game developer like Konami to be using, compared to PCM technology which became a standard in game consoles after the SNES. If anything, the MIDI modules really make this and other MIDI compatible X68000 games sound like the CD-ROM systems of the time. Many CD soundtracks on lower budget TurboGrafx and Sega CD games sound like they were produced on Roland MIDI modules, with sometimes only a few additional instruments or effects added. One curious thing exclusive to the Roland GS versions of the Dracula music is that they're a bit longer than the other arrangements. 
Most of the BGMs get an extra variation on the main theme before looping back to the beginning. I have no idea whether that's due to a technical advantage of the GS MIDI technology, or just because they wanted to make the GS versions extra long as a bonus for fans. At any rate, add longer songs to the list of music enhancements you get when using a GS-compatible MIDI module. Back in 1993, this was clearly the coolest way to play the game. No console at the time could sound nearly this good without a CD drive. As mentioned, the one port this game did receive to another platform was to the PlayStation 1 in 2001. That version makes part of the HUD transparent in order to adapt the original resolution for the PS1, and also includes an arrange mode with a few new graphics and yet another arrangement of the soundtrack. This one is mostly dance music. I've really enjoyed going back and practicing to get better at this game for this video. The X68000 Akamajo Dracula may not be the best of the 2D Castlevanias released in the early 90s, but the challenge and wealth of unique features taking advantage of the hardware make it a great game in its own right. It may be a game that we initially didn't get to play outside of Japan when it was first released, but if you're a Castlevania fan, then this game is certainly another title that is not to be missed. Thanks for watching this X68000 review on Basement Brothers. If you love Japanese gaming hardware from the 80s and 90s like we do, then you'll definitely want to check out our other content. Please remember to like, subscribe, and let your friends know about our channel if they're also into classic gaming. We'll be back with another video soon, so see you then.